and uh, have a, a couple of rounds of a bit more esoteric questions on judicial philosophy for the week. Uh, Nine o'clock, we'll do a hard stop, and you guys can sit here and take hands to the house. We have to throw you out of hand, but, and, and, I, and, and I'll be tearing down chairs. You can, you can meet here, you can meet outside, you can do whatever you want, or it's stuck at nine o'clock. The only change I've gotten, I did not invite uh, John Kimball, but uh, his, his uh, opponent uh, showed up. So I told you, if you have a question for um, the 44th district, right? Yes. The 44th district uh, candidate for state, uh, state delegate, uh, uh, no, no, no question. Okay. So, uh, uh, again, the, the rules are not quite simple. You've got a question of the, of the judge. If you got a commission, question of a Thomas <coughs> Walfell, you'll, you'll ask two of them because it, it'll be a commissioner question. Uh, if you got a JP question, you got three. Okay. Any, any questions? Go ahead. I'll go for the, uh, the commissioner's court solved a small problem by selecting one business and eliminating all the competition. What is your position? When our local government picking one privately owned business over another, removing freedom of the choice from an individual citizen who actually pays the business for the service. And I have a follow up with that. It goes to the, the, the judge. Okay, would you repeat the question where I can? Sure can. The commissioner's <coughs> court solved a small problem. Oh, I'll tell you what the problem was. It was a tow, tow cup company. Okay. Okay. And then, problem I have with it, it's a private business that I had to pay the bill on and I was being forced to go to move. I live in Southern Springs. But I didn't word it that way. I basically just said, where does it state that you have the rights to come into private business and select the business I have to do business <coughs> Okay, I don't know where it states that. I can tell you that right off. I'd have, have to search for it okay. like anybody else would. Okay, what the deal was is the county on a on a tow. Okay, if it's a mandatory tow where it's an accident or something, a DWI where they're going to tow the vehicle, uh, the county took bids from all tow. Well, I understand that. That's that's okay. how you solve the problem. The problem was a small problem on who the rotation of calls. That was a small problem. Okay. But then you knocked out all competitors. They all had the opportunity. And I, I don't have a part of the commissioner's board. By the way, do we have a new company from ever come to this county? No. Why? Because there's no competition, right? You only have one company that you get it. Now, okay. Do you realize that I was not here? I don't, I don't, I don't that happened. Let, me, let me jump to my, my second question and you guys can answer that. What will the criteria be for selecting the next? Did I get to finish that answer? I'm going to let you do that. Okay. For selecting the next government sponsored business, <coughs> what's the next? What, what's going to be your criteria for the very next business that you take over? I don't think I finished the first question. Answer. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm just okay. trying to get through real quick. Uh, and like I said, I don't give, there's a statute you're looking for that gives the right to that. I don't know about off the top of my head. I don't know if anybody here would know it right off the top of their head. Uh, but as far as like what they went out for bids for the county for the mandatory codes, that's what it was. It wasn't, if you're right. parked on the side of the road, you can get any tow company you want to. But if it's a mandatory tow that, that uh, a, DPS officers impounding your vehicle, or if it's impounded by the the, uh, the county, and I think the city they have their own companies that they use. But That's, why? But why? why? What do you mean? Okay, if I said I didn't know the statute. Why did they do the? Video? I don't know. I wasn't on commissioner's court. I wasn't there when they did. I wasn't there when they did it. I can I can make a suggestion. I think the rates of the tow companies that were on the rotation right. are getting pretty high. That's exactly what I heard. So how did you solve the problem? You got rid of the I did not company. solve the problem. No, but as a, as a government official, you got rid of all of them. Okay. Okay. That's what, I, that's, well, okay. I wasn't on commissioner's court, but it went out for bids. No, 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 and no, this no. is the company. Can I solve? Uh, yes. Okay. When I get through talking, then you can talk and have somebody else a question. Well, I'll, I'll be fine. Okay. 
Okay, the commissioner's court, like I said, I wasn't a part of it, went out for bids. They got the lowest bid, and that is the company that got the contract to haul the mandatory tows. Let, 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 me, let me see if we can clarify the one question I think may be a question to the folks in the audience. How is it possible, I think is what, what he's asking, how is it possible to enter into a contract with a business and you do not have the ability to pay them, but you require someone else to pay who you require? I mean, the contract law says, I hire you, I pay you, but that's not what happened. You hire them and he's paying. That, was, that, that is a question I would have. That's how I found out about it. Is that? I can tell you this one before I took office, but we just went out for bid last year. I know there was a problem when they weren't going to rotate call. Some records took them an hour to get to four or five miles, and then the fee would go up. They kept having trouble going up the fee. I know the county kept having complaints from citizens for, you know, the, the cost was so much for just a toll. And they went out for bids. We went for the lowest bidder. Same as this past time. The lowest bidder got the bid. We're not paying, I agree. The county ain't paying. It's the owner of the vehicle. And as far as I know, the county, the citizens aren't complaining. So it's a government sponsored program. <laughs> not really. We're not sponsored. We're just going out for bids because dispatch calls for a record. It, 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 same time 
Are the people coming to the commissioners' meeting? Are the commissioners going to the to the uh, city council meetings? So that's basically the first step there is just uh, starting there, just in relationship with uh, each uh, employee, if you will, or elected official. Whose responsibility would it be to ask in your county or all the The county asking the cities or the city requesting somebody else? Both. It's a two way street. I mean, we're all going to work together on that, and the mayor would probably have. I can tell you there was some. When I came up with Precinct 2 wasn't working a lot with the city. So that's one thing I've changed. And I will continue to work with the city of Florida Pope, or any of the cities. They pay county taxes to citizens, the city is paid county taxes like the county residents do. So we need to assist the city. We've already worked on several programs. I've tried to help her on getting some property for parks, housing that the county took over. I helped the city of Hope. I think that needs to be a continuing on situation where the commissioner needs to go talk to the, the mayor, the city manager, and see if they have any problems. Work it out. I've been aware that the city and the city have always worked together. I don't know if there's a conflict or anything going on now. The county commissioners, since I can remember, have always assisted. If there's something happening in Stockdale, the commissioner was over there, whether it be uh, Commissioner Wiley or was it Commissioner Stroud or Beatrick or whatever, they work with the city. Here, like uh, Paul said, he works with the city of Floorville and the city of Pope. Uh, Lavernia, I know uh, Bobby Lynn, when he was over there, there's certain lots of things that it was jointly done. The city needed something, the county provided that. Very, It's hard for the city to go out in the county to do something. It's a whole lot easier for the county to come to the city and do something. But if you have anything, approach the county and go work something out. Because I said the citizens of the cities also pay county taxes too. Yeah. I actually have two questions. And one, I'm going to follow up with what Ms. Turner said. Uh, one of the big issues that's come across in the county is animal control. And many of the cities are attempting to pass their own ordinances and regulations with that. And this is an issue that the county has addressed. There are many services that counties and cities provide that are duplicated. Okay? What areas can the county join with the cities to provide a single service countywide? Is animal control one of those? What other services could you consider to put on the table? And then I have a second. Animal control is a big, big problem in the county. It's a big problem in the city. I'll be honest with you. I know we started looking at some issues, uh, a way to, to try to get an animal control county wide. You want to try to either work with the city, try to get a program where they have to be let, tagged and licensed a dog or, or a cat, or an animal. But it's, it's, it takes a very expensive process to get a pound. Basically, you're looking at hiring three different people around the clock, and it may be something we have a joint effort with the city. Uh, I know we, the judge, Winnie, has talked about it very strongly, and we've talked about it in court. That's one of our, one of our issues. First of all, it, it's, it's money. It takes a lot of money to have a good pound. I know, I think, uh, Mr. Jackson and Judge Quinney going to uh, Hondo, and you've already looked at them. You know, it's something we're looking at. Uh, but it's going to take time because, like I say, the cost is much. Oh. Yes, and we call this. Uh, I can say, like uh, Paul said, yes, I have been with Judge Quinney and we have gone and inspected a facility that Hondo has. We have met with people that have come over and they have started animal control facilities in different counties. And we're, we're in the process, I say, in the process. We're looking at prices. How much is it going to cost us? It's going to have to be joined effort. The city of Florida, the city of Stoddale, city of Marina, city of Pope. It's going to have to go in too. It's going to have to, to be able to afford something to have a good facility and make it countywide. It's going to be just a joint effort. But let me just do two things and Jim, I'll just follow up. Do I get it? I'm sensing the commitment here between the judge and at least precinct two commissioners that you folks will be looking toward the city managers and or mayors to see if you can start planning on something to get some sense. Did I hear that right? I don't want to put a word there. 
Animal control is going to have to be something in the future. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't mean just on animal control. I mean on things that make sense where we can where we can have synergies between the two, the cities and the counties. Uh, are there ways? I think that was the original question that, that Henry had and, and, uh, and the Jim had. So I, uh, I'm hearing that I'm getting a love, love affair here. We're all going to we're going to work with the city. That, that's great. I definitely will. There are many of those services that we provide <laughs> countywide that involve the municipalities. Let's talk about law enforcement. Let's talk about fire protection. Let's talk about emergency medical services. Let's talk about road maintenance. Let's talk about a lot of the services that we duplicate efforts. Maybe not in the same, on the same street, but we're duplicating the, the same pieces of equipment. We're duplicating the same types of personnel that we can share county-wide to reduce costs, not only to the taxpayers of our county, but to the taxpayers of our cities. That's the synergy. That, that those are the types of projects that I was referred to, and hopefully the county will open up the dialogue with the appropriate representatives of the city to begin looking at those things, to say, what can we do better together versus separately and more efficiently for the taxpayers? My second question to the, the county elected officials is to answer the first question that was asked to them about the Eagle Four. You know, as a business owner, I can go to the bank and say, I have visions of this next year or in 10 years. Give me the money and I'll build it. Hopefully they will come. Hoping they will come is not an answer. We as county residents look to our elected, uh, elected officials to develop a plan to deal with growth to deal with expenses. We look at many large corporations. Their budgets are five and 10 and 15 years out. What are, we go what are you going to do for the county residents to prepare us for next year, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, and 15 years down the road as it relates to the Eagle Ford Shale and oil being here, maybe, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> okay, for late tenure, okay, I don't know if you remember when I was running my campaign, I said there will be a master plan. There will I will have I will get with other county officials and we will I am gonna start something where we're gonna plan what's gonna happen, what you said. One year down the line, two years, four years, eight years, twenty years down the line. What's gonna happen? That I mean it's not gonna happen tonight, uh, by any means, but yes, that's that was a plan I had all along. It's not something that I'm going to start right now. It's something that's going to happen when I take I, I didn't expect you to, to, to lay down a 10-year master plan. I, I was asking what things are you going to implement to, for that sort of thing, and that's exactly the answer that I was looking for. Thank you. Thomas or Paul, do you want to add anything? I can just say that being part of the development board that I, I, I represent and all, we're already looking at that. Uh, the, we're looking at new Things, how to get new businesses in here? How can we get new growth in here? New housing, new, new. Again, the water plant. Like I said, we're, the, the whole area is getting shorter water. There's a whole picture that has to be looked at, and and we are looking at things. Like I said, the development board is looking at a five, ten, and a fifteen, and twenty year plan, even on a new subdivision, on roads and, and construction roads, making roads wider. All this stuff is stuff we're looking at. Jackson said, it's not going to happen overnight, but I know starting in January, getting reelected, this is something we're going to really look at. I can tell you. It uh, really amazes me to know that all this has been going on for however many years, and ultimately, I have to agree, there, there has to be some type of plan in place. Uh, everyone in your own household or your business has some type of goal set or plans go forward with things. You, if you don't go anywhere, you're going to be stagnant, and that's kind of where we're at right now. I understand that it takes money to build the infrastructure to a, a town or city, uh, but yet at the same time, something has to be in place, uh, the plan, and, and I was not privy to that, the, the time frame that they, you know, that they're out right now, 20-year plan, but at the same time, uh, where, as far as the people, where, where, you know, where is this set up right now? 
Where, where's all the information? Can I, can we be together? I haven't taken off this yet. We're going to be together. No, 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 I mean, right now, they agreed to that. I didn't know if there was some place, county office, or somewhere where, where the people could see that. Because I think that's the biggest thing. When people know where the funds are going, they're more receptive to knowing that we do have a plan for the city and the county. So if there is a area, I know there's an open records act. You could go uh, look at all the information pertaining to how everybody spends their money. But at the same time, I think that needs to be uh, the focus of having a centralized area, whether it's a courthouse, annex, wherever, and then see that master plan and that schedule of uh, what, what they could expect in the future for the future of this county. I like your question, and that's a question that the mayor of Pope asked a few years ago. I don't know how many of you, I don't see anybody from Pope here today. Did anyone represent Pope? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gibbs. Yes, you do live in Pope now. <laughs> um, a few years ago, Travis Krusky, when he was mayor of Pope, approached me uh, about doing a concurrent judgeship, and it's something that Nikki Jackson has been doing for several years with uh, Stockdale as well as Laverne. It is legal within the uh, Texas law that a justice of the peace judge may also concurrently be a municipal judge. They both uh, consider class C misdemeanors, where municipalities do criminal cases only. JPs do both criminal and civil. And I know that Floresville just uh, lost their municipal judge, uh, Sheila Medina Garza. Judge Medina Garza just retired. And I know they have appointed a new judge. And that's great. And that judge is going to have to go through lots of training and is going to have to get his feet wet and all of those things. And one of those interlocal agreements, one of those things where people could work together is that um, I know one of the requirements for a municipal judge is that you must live within, within the city limits. And both JP1, Judge Villarreal, and I both live within the city limits of Floresville. So we both qualify on that end to have been selected or appointed as the municipal judge. Or not. That's fine. But if the city of Floresville city council requested of the commissioner's court to do an interlocal agreement, it could be that the two JPs would take turns and the <coughs> city could pay a smaller amount maybe to the two JPs to alternate. So that's a way that even the judicial branch could be involved in that, in addition to the commissioners of the roads and all of those kinds of things. So it's very thinking, out, it's thinking outside of the box maybe, but an interlocal agreement might work in those kinds of things, but it's going to require communication. It's something that if both wants to do it, great, we're open to that. Any way that we can find to help keep more money in my pocket and in your pocket, I think is going to be most beneficial and it's going to help more people. I don't like paying taxes either, <laughs> but I do like getting paid for what I do. I mean, if I wasn't doing this, I would be doing something else. But um, I think that whenever we're thinking about that and being <coughs> creative and coming up with visionary things, one other thing I said is um, to bring in and invite people with a vision, people who are known visionaries, people who have already thought it through, invite them in and let's sit down at a table and discuss some of the things that could be done and have a more open discussion. We've got time for at least one, maybe two, yes sir, right here. I have a question for the district judge candidates. Um, as it's been discussed tonight, the Eagleford show has brought about many new challenges. Some of these challenges even include gang and drug cartel um, activity throughout the entire 218th district. Both candidates have served the public in the courtroom. How have you dealt with these issues to protect our families from cartel and gang activity? <coughs> to 
work together against what we consider border crimes. Border crimes that involve cartel activity, that involve criminal enterprises, and that involve the criminal enterprise that the cartel is now getting involved with, uh, with our prison gangs. And we have lots of prison gangs in the area. We also have cartel activity in the area. Um, I know that's a shock to a lot of people when we talk about it. And I've heard people, uh, specifically I, I heard a person from one of our neighboring counties say about three months ago that she thought that cartel violence was a myth that the government created to scare people. And I am here to tell you that it is in your backyard, it is in your counties. There's money laundering, there's drug activity, <coughs> there's murders, there's all sorts of things that are related to gang violence. As a board prosecution unit attorney, we have been addressing that through getting DPS to work with our federal partners, to work with the different agencies within our district to look into these criminal enterprises, to not just get the street level dealers and the street level criminals, but to get the ones that are high up, that are making the decisions that are so damaging and so harming to our communities. Let me give you an example of a case that I did about three years ago in Atascosa County that deals with border prosecution and border crimes. We had a gentleman who came in from Honduras who came into the United States, into Texas, to see if he could get a job. He had to support his family, couldn't find one down there because they had to move. His mother had been murdered when she ratted out some MS-13 gang members that were in their neighborhood. He came across into Texas. The smugglers, he paid them their money, he paid them $3,000. The smugglers decided he had more money and they kept him locked in a room with burglar bars on the windows, stripped almost naked, and fed him top ramen for the better part of three weeks. When he finally got the opportunity to escape, they caught him and nearly beat him to death. That person that we prosecuted is what we call a criminal agent. It is somebody who comes across for the specific purpose of committing crimes and making profit in our communities. <coughs> In that particular case, a jury in Atascosa County heard it. They sentenced that person to 60 years confinement in the penitentiary. And what is interesting about it is we found through the course of exploring this case that that defendant had been deported, came back, deported, came back, deported, came back. And during the time that this was all going on, he was sexually assaulting his young sister-in-law. And after the jury gave him 60 years on the one case, he pled to six counts of aggravated sexual assault of a child. That's what we're doing here to try and combat border crime, cartel activity, and to make our communities a safe place for our children to grow up where they don't have to worry about the cartel violence that we've seen destroying the culture in Mexico that is slowly coming across to our boundaries and to our communities. <coughs> it's an excellent question, sir. Of course, as an elected county attorney, I don't have a background to be a border prosecutor, but I do have a background with this man's question, so I'll answer that. Sir, what you're talking about is called a non consent tow. A non consent tow is when a vehicle is not being towed with the consent of the owner. Now, sometimes the owner really is consented. When the sheriff's department goes out and makes a call to a tow truck company, <coughs> under the law, that's a non consent tow. Now, that happens when the sheriff's Department has arrested somebody. Highway Patrol has come upon an accident. They found an abandoned vehicle. They found a vehicle that's not abandoned, but it's just not working. Okay? We had a situation for a number of years where the people were just being ripped off in this county. The commissioners have tried to pass rules and regulations, and they tried to regulate how much to be charged in the tow companies. Some of them these routinely charge way too much. Uh, they passed a regulation that said it's a little bit for a regular cheap tow where they just have to hook the vehicle up and tow it off. And it costs more if you're going to put a dolly underneath and then drag it up onto a flatbed trailer. So the tow truck companies, or some of them at least, would go out and they take a vehicle that had a busted radiator from an accident, perfectly towed, but then you could drive it to a motor line. And they would put a dolly underneath it and then tow it up onto a flatbed trailer and charge a person $500 to tow it two months. And the commissioners finally said, had enough of that, 
I'm going to go to one system. I'm going to do this only for non consentos based in the Wilson County Sheriff's Department. The Wilson County Sheriff's Department, the Wilson County is the person who's contracting for that. And you ask, how can you force somebody else to pay for it? Sometimes that's what happens. If you get hit by a vehicle and you walk out of here tonight and the ambulance comes to pick you up, if you're conscious, conscious and you're not about to expire, they'll have to rush you for the first problem work. And you say, you know what, I'm retired from the military. Can you take me to the Veterans Hospital? If they have the time, they can take you to the Veterans Hospital, right? But if they say, no, you need to care faster than that, or we've got two other calls piled up, we're taking you to Wilson County. And you're going to Wilson County, and you're going to get the bill for that, even though that's not the place where you want to go. That's exactly what happens with this sort of time. The county was very careful when they wrote the regulation. They were very careful and very fair when they went out and gave all the tow truck companies an opportunity to bid. And you know, the company that won was out of San Antonio. And I ask you, how many problems, how many complaints have the commissioners and county judge had that they took and picked a San Antonio company over all the local tow truck companies? It gives you an idea of how bad this was. The local tow truck companies went to district court, they filed a lawsuit, they had a visiting judge come down here, and I successfully defended that lawsuit for Wilson County. That was appealed up in the fourth court of appeals. We wrote our briefs, we had oral arguments. I successfully within the ordinance of the commissioners had written the fourth court of appeals. The court of appeals are very ordinary and they said no. Absolutely Wilson County can do this. They were fair how they did it, but I hope their ability to do it. And at that point the Tokyo company has decided it wasn't worth a while to try and keep on appealing to the Texas Supreme Court and they let it go. So that's the answer. Yes, sometimes bad things I'm sure still can't happen. Understand that it's aggravating if you don't get the, uh, the vehicle towed to where you want it to go. I just tell you that, trust me, the situation we have now is worlds better than what it was a few years ago, and you could have doubled or doubled or half the bill that you got to So the commissioners have protected you from that. Okay, I'm going to. I, 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 we, we want to do a, a, a more in depth with the 280. So, uh, if, uh, if you have a burning question, uh, please hold it, and at 9 o'clock, we'll do a hard stop, and you can talk to these folks back there while, while we start to tear down. Anybody? Fair enough? Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. There are three major areas we're interested in from which we will ask questions. These three areas are one, legislating from the bench, interpreting legislation, and determining the original intent of legislation, of legislation. And three, implementing a concept of a fully informed jury. Constitutional theory for various references if you choose to use them. It's not like this is going to be tough. Alright. Gary, your first question. It's a first round of questions in the category of legislating from the bench. definition of the legislative from the bench. How is the process of making rulings on questions of law, the admissibility of evidence, and 
other matters during the course of the trial to be different from the legislating from the bench. Do you that again? Russell, you're going to get this question first. How is the process of making rulings on questions of law, the admissibility of evidence and other matters during the course of the trial, to be different than legislating from the bench? Clear? Yes. Okay. To me, legislating from the bench would be when the judge no reference to any guiding principles goes out is there's something you know you can argue about whether or not the Supreme Court of the state or the United States sometimes has a duty to do that when new questions come up but district judges the trial level judges are supposed to follow the law as it's handed down they're not supposed to just go and make up new stuff that doesn't mean that that process is sometimes involved making decisions about what the law means when the legislature, uh, especially the Texas legislature, if I can raise the occasion. Give you an example from just a JP case, uh, which candidate's predecessor. Uh, legislature passed, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, a law that said that if you're an underage driver, you can't have more than one or two, some number of other underage kids, other juveniles in the vehicle with you. They're trying to stop this problem that we had sometimes where you'll have you know, eight teenagers in a vehicle driven by a 16-year-old at 180 miles an hour and killed them. So we show up in JP court one day, people want a bench trial, and this kid got pulled over with like four other youngsters in the car with him. And the law said you couldn't have more than one other, two others who weren't family members. But it didn't say what a family member was. It didn't say siblings, it didn't say members of your household, it says family members. Well, this is Poe, it's a small town, and the driver's attorneys over there are saying, you know, tell me about the kids in here. And the kid goes, well, this one's my brother, and this one's my cousin, and this one's my cousin, and this one's like a brother to me. And you go through all this, and he's related to all of them, or he thinks he's related to all of them, feel free he's related to all of them. Are they family members? And I didn't doubt for a minute, yeah, they were cousins. So what do you do? Because the law just said family members. I suggested to Judge Brandon, and, and she's, without knowing what the answer was as far as applied to this case, Judge, it doesn't say sibling, it doesn't say member of your household, so it's got to be some broader definition than just somebody that you live with. But, you know, my goodness, there could be a thousands of kids, uh, you know, you have in your vehicle with any traceable relation at all. I said, we'll create the fiction that the driver is the county commissioner. And if that other kid is related to that driver so closely that if the driver was a county commissioner and violated the nepotism law for him to hire that other kid as a county employee, I'll say, yeah, you're a family member, and you don't count against the limit. And Judge Brandon said she would do that. The defense attorney went with that, and we went and asked, and sure enough, the kid was not that closely related to enough of the other individual the driver was not. So, yeah, the judge should not just make stuff up. The judge should not say, you know what, we're all related at some point, so I'm just going to abolish this law that says you can't have more than one or two other kids who aren't family members with you. But sometimes the judge does have to make a decision about what the law is. Now, eventually, even though it's a Class C case, there will probably be a situation where that gets peeled up to the Court of Appeals in San Antonio, Texas Court of Criminal Appeals in Austin, and there will be a ruling on that. But until that happens, there are still a lot of cases where the judge just has to say, what was the legislature trying to do? And what's a common sense solution that vindicates what the legislature was trying to do and is fair to the parties involved? Either Mr. Wilson and I are currently not going to disagree on a lot of these questions that were being asked because I tend to agree with some of what he said. And that is, of course, that legislating from the bench is essentially creating new law. What judges are asked to do, what district judges are asked to do, is to take law that has been accepted and apply them to the facts of the case. That's totally different to me than creating new law. This is taking accepted law, <coughs> looking at the facts of each individual case, and applying those facts to that particular case. I think that, um, I, I don't know that we've ever had a problem with any of our judges in this district doing that. 
what I have seen upon occasion, this is again not legislating from the bench, but it is when judges will tell you when you're arguing a motion in front of them, and I've had this happen to me multiple times, and they say, you know what, I don't know what the law is when I look at your tax situation, so I want you to concentrate on these issues I want you to go out and brief that for me. I want you to do a case law search and tell me what prior courts have said in regard to that issue. That is not legislating from the bins. That is merely interpreting the law and applying it to the facts of the case. That is what I've always seen our district judges do. Certainly that's what I would intend to do. And I think that those two things, legislating from the bench versus interpreting cases, and those situations have nothing in common. Okay, bear with me. The second round of questions is in the category of fully informed juries. Few doubt that the American judicial system is the fairest in the world, but we all agree it's not perfect, not without some problems. Sometimes the court and judges must enforce unjust laws or administer laws in ways that seem inherently unfair. Our founders saw this problem with the Sixth Amendment, which protected the right to speedy public trial by an impartial, fully <coughs> informed jury. The judge is compelled to follow the law even if it is unjust or unfair. The jury's role is to seek justice by voting with their conscience, not necessarily blindly following an unjust law. Webster defined the petty jury as having the authority to decide both, both the law and the fact in criminal prosecutions. Until relatively recently, around 1960, juries routinely determined both fact and law. It has fallen out of vogue in law schools to teach that juries have this right. There are scores of quotes from our founders that confirm juries could determine both fact and law. Finally, Article 1, Section 8 of the Texas Constitution supports a fully informed jury when it states in part, quote, in all indictments for libels, the jury shall have a right to determine the law and the facts. Okay, Gary, you get the first question. Since our Texas Constitution supports a fully informed jury, do you believe that allowing a jury in a criminal trial to determine both the facts of the case and the law would be a benefit in the finding of justice in our courts. Can you read that again? Since our Texas Constitution supports a fully informed jury, do you believe that allowing a jury in a criminal trial to determine both the facts of the case and the law would be a benefit in the finding of justice in our courts? tried numerous jury trials, a hundred plus jury trials. I find that many times jurors are intimidated by what they are asked to do. Um, when we first do board dire at the beginning when we're doing jury selection, um, there are many people who really have no idea what their role is. Um, they don't want to be on juries. They don't have an interest in being on a jury. And what happens is we each have strikes. Each side has strikes. We strike the people that we think will be bad for our case. The other side strike the people that they think will be bad for their case. And we end up with 12 members who may or may not want to be on that jury, but they just happen to be there. Some of those people may be very interested in the law of the case, and some of them may not be. The laws are so complex nowadays. They're not codified in one little book. They're reams and reams of books. I think by just telling the jury, you need to decide what the law is, we're giving them, or uh, serving them a disadvantage. I think we're trying to tell them, you guys need to be fully trained. You guys need to have gone to law school or have studied law to be able to be a juror and to be an effective juror. And I don't think that is uh, the way it should be. I think that jurors should do exactly what they do now, and that is the judge tells them <coughs> the law that is applicable in the case, and the jurors decide what the facts are in the case and whether or not uh, in a 
criminal case a person is guilty or not guilty. I don't know that saying you as a juror will determine the law that is applicable is going to give the defendant the fair trial that he deserves, and I don't know that it's going to give the victim their fair trial that he or she deserves. that the judge has duty to read to the jurors says that you, the judge of the facts, jury, that you're supposed to receive the law from the court. I would certainly read that to you. Well, I think that the fully informed jury movement is trying to get at, or should be trying to get at, in its best, in its best life, is the idea that courts are supposed to be about justice, and that there may be some extreme, extraordinary case where it would be an injustice to return a conviction or to you know, return a verdict in a civil case. Now, as a matter of fact, jurors have a great deal of discretion to go back there and vote on what they want. And if they decide that there is just an extreme injustice you're being allowed to take part in, uh, they have a lot of ability right now to go ahead and do that. Uh, should they be told by the judge that they have the right to do that? If the judge is following what the case law is here in Texas, they would not be told that. The attorneys have an opportunity to argue for that. I think that you know, in civil cases, the attorneys are supposed to represent their clients. In criminal cases, I've only ever seen that really done one time. That was in this district. I don't even know why I was in Manitoba County. I, I saw a guy named Al Hernandez, who's a former assistant DA here. Uh, he was a defense attorney at that time. He made an argument, and I would be willing to give the defense attorneys if they think it's right some discretion to make that argument to the jury. With the caveat that, I would expect that the district attorney's office is doing their job, and they're gonna say, you know what? This is not an injustice. It is justice for you to follow the law and forgive this person. As long as the district attorney's office is doing that, then it won't have any effect on the outcome of the case. But no, if the, as long as the law in Texas says that the judge is to instruct the jurors to say that the court gives them the law and they're the judge of the facts, I would do that, and if the defense attorney wants some discretion, try and say this is an outrage, it's an injustice, return a, a, a acquittal, even if my client is technically guilty of it, I would give them some discretion to do that, expecting that we have a good DA's office that's ethical and responsible, and that they're going to come back and say, no, it is absolutely just to be a big business. And let the jury just decide who they go with. Thank you, Yeah, I, I, we're, we're going to cut it off. Um, we, we had a couple more, that were pretty good, but uh, I wanted to, to give each uh, each candidate thirty seconds to, to say why you ought to vote for me. And we'll start right here. Well, I'm the last, but I don't have an opponent. <laughs> I'm the last, but I don't have an opponent. Great answer. <laughs> I am a very honest person. I am high integrity, and um, I care about my county, and I uh, love my community, and I uh, spent most of my life serving, and I plan on uh, serving our community and our county to the best of my ability, and uh, I really appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. I bring to you over 15 years of experience working with misdemeanor and felony prosecutors, as well as adults and children. Having served in the capacity of a juvenile probation officer and adult probation officer, I'm familiar with courtroom procedures, the penal code, the family code, the civil code, and with the requirements of the school district and all school districts disciplinary systems set forth by the state regarding truancy and unexcused absences. In addition to that, I have the responsibility, the knowledge, and the ethics needed to perform the duties of the justice piece effectively. I'll be mindful of your tax dollars in terms of spending and the justice court and work diligently to run an efficient and effective office. Sarah. My name is Sarah Candy and I love my job. I really do. Serving the families at Precinct 2 has been just a joyful journey for me for the past three and a half years. And I 
I would love the opportunity to do that again. I appreciate you coming out tonight and sacrificing time away from your family to become a more informed voter. And I've done the best that I can. I don't know of any overt or terrible complaints against me. If there is, I'd love to hear them. But um, I work very hard with the juveniles. I work with all of the complaints that come to me, both civil and criminal. I've exceeded my mandatory training hours every year, and I just came back from receiving a distinguished award from the Justice Court Judges College. So I'm really excited about that, and I look forward to serving you all for four more years. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And I didn't mean to put Dickie and uh, Paul on the uh, chopping block a while ago, but that's one of the aspects of commissioners is uh, showing the people what's going on in the community so with that accessibility and communication to the people that they would know where their tax dollars are going and so what I ask is that you look at the commissioners and uh, see who's the best candidate and I would appreciate your vote with honest integrity I'll serve this community we are elected by you so we are working for you thank you Paul well, again I can thank all y'all for coming out tonight Staying out here late.